short story. <clears throat> on my first day uh, on the job at LinkedIn, uh, which, by the way, uh, fell on February 29th of uh, the leap year, and that's why I probably don't uh, receive any uh, work anniversary congratulations so far. So anyways, on the first day on the job, I uh, was informed by my manager that uh, the name node on uh, one of the big clusters uh, was having a meltdown. And name node meltdown means that uh, <clears throat> Cluster is inaccessible, so nobody can run jobs, nobody can access data. And <clears throat> my first reaction was, okay, let's go to fry it by more memory. Uh, later, I learned uh, by analyzing the logs of this uh, name node that indeed, the problem was with memory, but we didn't need to run to fries because the node had enough memory, it just was configured not to use it all. Uh, so <clears throat> that was my uh, that was the start of my journey uh, <clears throat> uh, with uh, scaling Hadoop at LinkedIn. And in this talk, we'll uh, <clears throat> present uh, techniques and uh, projects that helped us uh, quadruple the infrastructure in the last two years. So LinkedIn runs its analytics on Hadoop. It starts with members. Members create social activity. Social activity results in data. And analysts run analytics on, on that data. And uh, the result of analysis, of course, is intended to create more members, which will in turn create more social activity and more data. And uh, that's the vicious cycle of growth. Uh, <clears throat> our Hadoop ecosystem, our analytics ecosystem is based on Hadoop, the core Hadoop, uh, which consists of storage, HDFS, and uh, compute, yarn, and MapReduce. We run standard Hadoop tools, uh, Hadoop stack tools uh, on top of that, uh, including Peak, Hive, Cascading. Uh, our Spark <clears throat> usage is growing. Uh, uh, extensively, we started uh, to use TensorFlow for uh, uh, for uh, machine learning. Askaban is our workflow scheduler. Uh, we have a lot of ETL, which is uh, mostly based on the open source pro uh, project Goblin, and we have internal uh, tool which we call Dali. It's a data abstraction and access uh, layer for Hadoop. Uh, we actively use Dr. Elephant for analyzing uh, Hadoop jobs, who is artificially intelligent, polite, but uncompromising bot. And we use Presto for uh, <clears throat> distributed, uh, as a distributed SQL engine. So <clears throat> the, in Hadoop, storage and compute are tightly intertwined. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, data, Data and compute share the same nodes, and uh, increase in data also leads to increase in compute and uh, <clears throat> more nodes. And uh, compute more compute generates, of course, more data. So this graph represents our main problem and our ma main uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, challenge. Uh, so. Uh, we uh, 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 we put the three main dimensions of uh, of the infrastructure uh, and uh, measured them year over year over year. The dimensions are space used by the cluster, the number of objects, uh, which includes files and blocks and uh, directories, and the number of tasks. And we see on this graph that over. Uh, over two years, uh, the infrastructure was doubling every year. And we also see that compute is uh, <clears throat> growing a little bit uh, faster. So in the rest of the talk, we'll uh, primarily focus on the uh, uh, storage infrastructure. So uh, this is a little bit about uh, uh, HDFS architecture. Uh, so it uh, consists, uh, the metadata is separated from data and metadata is uh, entirely stored in, on the name node. Uh, the entire uh, 
tree of uh, directory tree is stored in its uh, memory. Uh, the data files are split into blocks, rather large blocks, and stored on multiple uh, data nodes. So when an HDFS client needs to uh, <clears throat> read or write data, it will first go to the name node and get all the metadata about the blocks and then uh, write into data nodes uh, or read data from them. Let's talk about uh, balancing. So <clears throat> people used to uh, uh, <clears throat> think about uh, infrastructure uh, in a homogeneous, uh, very homogeneous uh, <clears throat> way, uh, like rows of uh, servers and uh, uh, shiny blades. Uh, in reality, uh, <clears throat> the clusters look more like this. Uh, because over time, uh, different types of servers uh, are added to the cluster and uh, they're all different sizes. So in order to support that uh, homogeneous, uh, sorry, <clears throat> heterogeneous environment, uh, a lot of balancing is happening on the cluster. Uh, balancing is important because uh, if you <clears throat> have unbalanced uh, more data, for example, on one node, then it will get more uh, work as well. And as a result, it will generate more data on that, uh, uh, on that data node. So <clears throat> keeping, in, keeping in balance is uh, important. And, the ba and for, for that purpose, we have a balancer. Balancer is, uh, works in iterations, and in each iteration, it uh, moves uh, data from uh, Overutilized nodes to underutilized node. Uh, this is very. This is highly <clears throat> uh, multi-threaded environment, and each thread uh, <clears throat> uh, goes first to the name node and uh, calls get block and uh, gets the list of uh, data, uh, the list of blocks, and the source data node, uh, which uh <clears throat> it should move data from. Then it chooses a tar target data node and schedules. Uh, uh, the uh, the moves the the transfers uh, which uh, are performed independently of on the by, by the data nodes themselves. So we found two interesting problems with balancing, and we fixed them. So one problem was uh, <clears throat> at the start of the iteration of the balancer, all the threads. This is a multi-threading, uh, highly multi-threading environment, as I said all of them will go to the name node and try to get this, uh, list, their lists of blocks. And uh, that uh, brings name node, uh, <clears throat> uh, th that puts a lot of load on the name node so other jobs cannot proceed. So we fixed it by dispersing the initial, uh, initial, uh, <clears throat> Uh, initial calls to the name node over 10 seconds and not more than 20 uh, requests per second to the name node. Uh, the second problem was uh, inefficiency in executing the, uh, the call, the get block call on the name itself. itself. So it first, it starts from a starting point, randomly chosen starting point, and then uh, selects blocks starting from that uh, point. Uh, but the <clears throat> move to that starting po point was very inefficiently. It was scanning all the bo block from the beginning. So when we uh, fixed that problem by introducing the jumping lo logic, uh, we <clears throat> improved performance 4x, and uh, it went from 40 milliseconds to 10 milliseconds. So the final result of this work was that balancer overhead on the name node was completely invisible for uh, user programs. Uh, block report processing is another uh, <clears throat> important part of the uh, name node. Before we go there, there is a pop quiz. What do Hadoop clusters and particle colliders like LHC have in common? Any ideas? Size? Yeah, big size. Okay, very good. High speed, indeed. But the most important is that uh, <clears throat> improbable events 
uh, happen on both all the time. I mean, even, even though they are, the probability is very low because of the size and the speed, uh, <clears throat> we have uh, all those in, uh, improbable events. So we found one of those uh, <clears throat> uh, rare events on our cluster with uh, uh, block report processing. So block report processing, uh, uh, Block reports are sent by data nodes uh, to the name nodes so that the name node would know about uh, blocks that are really stored on the data node. This is a periodic. Uh, <clears throat> by default, uh, it's six, uh, six hours every data node and uh, six, uh, every six hours the block report, but because there is so many data nodes, the name node is busy processing block reports all the time. And there was a rare, uh, rare uh, race condition. Uh, <clears throat> so any operation to the name node can time out. If a block report times out, the data node will send it again, will repeat uh, the same report. And so the race condition was related to name node processing the same two reports from the data node uh, <clears throat> concurrently. Uh, that was um, uh, rather uh, long and uh, epic JIRA. Uh, but it fixed the problem and simplified the uh, logic. And uh, uh, we <coughs> also designed uh, the next step, segmented block report, which is in this JIRA. Uh, we haven't implemented it yet. Cluster versioning. Last year, we upgraded to uh, <coughs> Hadoop 2.7. We uh, put an effort and uh, helped the community with releasing 2.7, 2.7.4, 2.7.5, and 2.7.6. And uh, <clears throat> we also benefited from, uh, of course, uh, the community testing. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of tools uh, out there in different companies uh, for manual and automated testing. Uh, we integrated with Apache Big Top. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, benefit from their testing. Uh, we, perf we did uh, some internal performance testing with Dynamometer, which Eric will talk about later. And we use standard benchmark tools provided with Hadoop, uh, which are DFS IO, S-Live, and GridMix. For internal testing uh, uh, in-house, in uh, we uh, also tested uh, things like ro rolling upgrades, or queue. Orq is another feature that we contributed to uh, <coughs> Yarn MapReduce. Uh, <coughs> and we also uh, per component did the per component testing, and we ran a, a set of uh, production job. Uh, as with any uh, upgrade, something will go wrong, right? I mean, usually they do. So there was one thing. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we DDoSed, when we turned on our cluster, we DDoSed our uh, <clears throat> uh, InGraphs. InGraphs is a metrics collection system. So uh, the new version of Hadoop came with uh, a lot of new metrics, which by default were turned on. And so this uh, <clears throat> completely uh, saturated the uh, service. And uh, you really need to, to the large scale. We couldn't see it on a smaller cluster with uh, prior testing. Uh, Eric will talk about uh, satellite cluster project and dynamometer now. Cool. So the next thing I want to talk about is um, a project that we embarked on to combat the small file problem a little bit on Hadoop. <clears throat> Um, so for anyone who's tried to manage a large HDFS cluster, I'm sure you've encountered um, the problem of people storing a bunch of small files on your HDFS. Um, so HDFS is, of course, designed for these big files, right? Um, we call them the elephants in our clusters. So these, uh, the idea is that the, each file should be very large in size because the whole design of HDFS is predicated on the idea that the data stored by each file is many orders of magnitude larger than the metadata required to store that file. Um, so uh, it's, an, it's a very tricky problem to try to uh, keep a cluster which has only these elephants. Um, as we all know, mice are, sorry, elephants are very scared of mice. And so having these little files in your HDFS cluster can really hurt your performance. 
Um, so to, to start off, we're just going to define what a small file means here. So we're going to consider that to be anything that's less than one block in size. Um, so by default, that's going to be 128 um, megabytes. And so um, the reason these types of files are bad is that each file requires, at minimum, two objects stored in memory on the name node. So that's an inode um, representing sort of its place in the file space hierarchy and um, a block representing that data. And so in particular, um, a 128 megabyte file and a 10 kilobyte file both um, require the same amount of data on the name node, right? Uh, one inode and one block. Whereas, and so, you know, you can have a 128 megabyte file, um, which is storing many orders of magnitude more data than these 10 kilobyte files. So these small files um, can bloat the memory usage of the name node. There's a lot of metadata associated with a small amount of data. And they also lead to a much higher RPC call volume on the name node. Um, since let's say you're storing um, some fixed size of data, if uh, it's stored in small files, that means there's more of them. And so when you want to do a listing or collect all of the data about that total data set, that requires many more calls to the name node. Um, so it's kind of a, a double whammy here of making the name node more slow because you've added more memory, more garbage collection overhead, et cetera, and you're, do you're making it service more calls. Um, and we see in practice that although it would be great if um, everyone was a, a friendly user of HDFS and only created large files, uh, we see in practice that that's not true at all. And actually, our block to inode ratio steadily decreases. Um, so it's now at about 1.11. Um, so 90% you know, of our files are small. Um, so you know, we asked ourselves the question, what do we do about this? And so we, we did some introspection and noticed that actually um, a lot of these small files were system logs created by the system daemons themselves. So um, yarn logs, MapReduce, uh, application master logs, et cetera. And um, we found that the average size of these log files is only about 100 kilobytes. Um, so in particular, you can see on the right here, um, the data volume stored from these logs was less than 0.1% of the total data on our cluster, yet it was taking up almost 50% of the objects on the name node. Um, given that the name node is kind of the primary scalability bottleneck for HDFS, this you know, indicated some really big room for improvement. Um, and in particular, this was, uh, this was actually a good realization for us because these log files are only accessed by uh, system daemons, right? So um, the node manager, application masters, history servers, um, the yarn logs command, Dr. Elephant. And so this gives us, as the cluster administrators, kind of a central place to um, take action on these files, as opposed to if they were user files, then it's a little bit more tricky to you know, change behavior among the thousands of our users, as opposed to changing the behavior of a few system daemons. Um, so what we did to handle this is we kind of separated out these log files and just gave the mice their own cluster. Um, so we created two um, HDFS cluster, which to our users kind of logically appear as one, um, but they're separated and one has about two orders of magnitude more data nodes than the other. So um, the desired end goal is that all the system logs reside on one cluster and all of our large data files reside on um, the larger cluster. But that uh, led us with a very difficult question of how do we bootstrap this? Uh, we had over 100 million files to copy over. We did some experiments about just running a naive DCP, and the DCP would fail, would run out of memory. When we finally got it to work, it would uh, take on the order of 12 hours to a day, and we couldn't take that kind of downtime during the migration. <clears throat> um, so what we did instead is we decided to just update all uh, daemons to write new files to the new cluster, and then uh, created a custom file system Im implementation, which gives us a combined read view of both clusters. And so that lets us uh, transparently migrate to the new cluster, where um, new log files are written to the new cluster. If you're trying to read old log files, you maybe read it from the new cluster or maybe read it from the old cluster. Um, and then a log retention policy eventually means that all the log files on the old larger cluster are eventually cleaned up. Um, and we did this in a way such that it was very completely transparent to the user or to the daemons themselves um, by just creating a new custom file, file system implementation, which contains this logic. Um, and so just to drive that point home a little, um, this is kind of what the architecture looks like. So we have this one very small cluster. Um, but in particular, it's important to point out um, all of the bulk data transfer is staying local to the original cluster. So um, kind of one of the big drawbacks of having multiple Hadoop clusters acting as one logical cluster is that you lose data locality. Um, so we're leveraging the fact that all of our large data files stay in the same cluster. We don't lose any locality. <coughs> um, but we also leverage that 
although this new cluster is much cheaper because it has you know, on the order of 100 times less uh, fewer data nodes, um, it still has the same namespace capacity. So it kind of doubles our namespace capacity at only a fraction of extra cost. And um, we don't get hurt by the lack of data locality since the amount of bulk data movement is actually very small. So um, the next thing I'm going to talk about, and uh, Constantine alluded to this a little bit, is um, a system called Dynamometer that we built for testing HDFS. <clears throat> so uh, we, wanted, we, we set out with the goal of developing kind of a realistic performance benchmark and stress test for HDFS. There's a number of tools built into the open source release which allow you to do some sort of performance testing of HDFS, uh, but we found that they really just don't come close to emulating what a real environment looks like. And um, you know, there are a lot of issues that you encounter at scale, at running at the multi-thousand node cluster scale that you just don't see when you run on your small test cluster or on um, kind of the standard benchmarks. So we built this tool. Um, it's now been open sourced on our GitHub, and we hope to contribute it into Apache Hadoop directly soon. Um, and essentially, we had two goals with this. One is to evaluate the scalability limits of HDFS. Um, so you know, we need to be able to say, with HDFS's current performance, Will we be OK when our data doubles in a year? Um, and you know, if not, what do we do about that? And also to be able to provide confidence before deploying a new feature or configuration. Um, you know, there are many features and configurations in HDFS which can be turned on via a simple uh, flag. And that can have very far-reaching consequences beyond what you may have originally anticipated. And so being able to test that in an environment that looks like your production cluster, but without the um, possibility of negatively affecting your production workloads, was a, a big goal for us. Um, so to speak a little bit about what this looks like, uh, what we do is we essentially run a simulated HDFS cluster on top of Yarn. So um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, the real scalability bottleneck in HDFS is the name node itself. So that's what we really want to focus on testing. And so we run a real name node um, using pretty much standard configurations taken directly from our production system. And we run uh, fake data nodes, which sort of only act as a data node as far as they need to fool the name node into thinking that there are data nodes there. Um, they don't actually store any data. They don't write anything to disk. Um, and so this lets us pack a lot more data nodes onto each node. We run about 100 data nodes on each physical machine. Um, and because all of these sort of uh, complicated bits of a data node are mocked out, um, we're able to you know, pack them very densely like that. And um, so it's not just about getting all of these data nodes in place and having kind of an HDFS cluster running. It's also about being able to make that HDFS cluster experience the same load that it does in production. Uh, the, the workload that a name node experiences has huge performance implications for it. So we want to make sure that we're not just kind of naively submitting a bunch of uh, make -ders or a bunch, a bunch of listings um, that don't reflect our real workload. So how we, how we handle this is we collect audit logs from our real production cluster and replay them back. So this is very high fidelity, very faithful to what our production cluster experiences, both in terms of the data node side and in terms of the, um, the workload uh, coming in from clients. And so all of this together takes about 5% of the hardware of running one of our real production clusters, which brings it down to the order of magnitude that we can dedicate that hardware to, to um, testing, whereas we can't set aside a multi-thousand node cluster just for testing. Um, and so the next thing I'm going to talk about is actually, uh, we'll go into a use case for Dynamometer a little bit, but it's going to focus on um, locking in the namespace on the name node. So <clears throat> um, all of the metadata about your HDFS file system is stored in memory on the name node, right? And um, we have to protect all of that metadata from concurrent modification to ensure uh, consistency. So there is a single uh, read-write lock which protects this entire files, um, file namespace. And it's a standard Java read-write lock, which means that it has two modes that you can put it into. So the first is fair. And this means that locks are acquired in FIFO order. Um, so basically, if a thread A comes, tries to get a lock, thread B comes, tries to get a lock later, it's guaranteed that thread A will get that lock before thread B. And this is the default in HDFS, kind of for its fairness properties. There's also a mode called non-fair, in which locks can be acquired out of order. And so um, this basically means that uh, if, a, if a read lock is already being held and there's some writers trying to wait to acquire the exclusive write lock and another reader comes along, it can kind of jump past those writers and then um, grab the read lock. And so this increases the read parallelism 
um, with the potential to discriminate against rights. And so the name node operations in most production clusters are um, very heavily biased towards reads. So the intuition is that if we um, improve the performance of reads, that should give us good performance benefits overall. But um, we don't know that for sure without actually doing testing, right? And we don't want to just enable this on our production cluster um, to avoid situations like a name node meltdown, someone on their first day having to uh, spend the whole day debugging a name node. So how do we do this? We test via dynamometer. Um, so what I'm showing here is uh, the top two lines are using the non-fair, or sorry, using the fair default lock, um, a graph of on the x-axis the requests that the name node is servicing per second, and on the y-axis how long each request has to wait before it is serviced. And um, so those two lines at the top are measured one on dynamometer and one on our real production cluster. You can see they very closely match each other. So this gives us confidence that we know dynamometer is acting correctly and going to give us. Um, accurate performance results. So then uh, the gray line at the bottom, we tested enabling the uh, non-fair locking mode, and we saw you know, all of our wait times come way down. And so this gave us confidence. We deployed it in production. You can see that on the T line, and you can see that, again, our predictions matched very closely. Um, and you can also see that this was a huge performance win for us. Um, and just to kind of drive that point home, this is a snapshot of InGraphs, our in-house metrics collection system. And you can see when we deployed non-fair locking, um, the metrics looked much nicer. Everyone was very happy. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Constantine to talk a little bit about um, the uh, journaling or storing of edit logs. Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> uh, so journaling is a part of the <clears throat> Uh, uh, name node persistent state. Uh, persistent state consists of the latest checkpoint, which we call FS image, and the journal itself, which records uh, the uh, uh, <clears throat> transactions since, uh, since the last checkpoint. Uh, it's also known as edit log. So <clears throat> journaling uh, essentially uh, uh, is uh, journaling batches uh, uh, multiple journal transactions into, on average, one kilobyte uh, chunks, uh, then writes them to disk and syncs and uh, uh, fl flushes and syncs them. So it's a very heavy I.O. Uh, workload and very specific. And uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, we used, uh, uh, and it essentially defines the uh, <clears throat> the performance of the name node, how many, how many uh, operations you can do per second. Uh, so we used uh, standard, uh, name, uh, standard uh, Hadoop uh, benchmark called th uh, an throughput benchmark. Uh, and uh, it is uh, <clears throat> uh, optimized for uh, memory usage, so it does not take in into account the overhead of RPC, so it really shows how fast uh, operations can be executed. And so we chose uh, three operation make dears, uh, which creates a directory, uh, create a file and rename a file, and we chose five different storage configurations for the journal. Uh, so one, uh, uh, one, one, uh, one, one storage device was a regular SATA drive. This is what we use now. Uh, <clears throat> and that was a comparison uh, point for us. So SAS drives are 15 to 25 percent turned out to be faster than SATA drive on this workload. Uh, the <clears throat> SSD drives uh, were on par with uh, SATA drives. That result was uh, uh, somewhat unexpected for some people, and uh, software rates, we hope that software rates will benefit from striping, but uh, it never happened because the chunk of the data that we write is much smaller than the uh, stripe size, so essentially you are writing uh, <coughs> on a single disk all the time. Um, the hardware rate uh, is, uh, w w was really... Uh, <coughs> surprisingly good. Uh, so we see that for uh, make gear it's uh, about two and a half uh, times faster and on average it's two, it's two times faster than uh, SATA drives. The trick there is that the memory, uh, that the rate card uh, is equipped with the memory 
internal memory uh, backed up with a capacitor, which uh, has enough energy to flush memory into SSD when uh, power failure occurs. So uh, <clears throat> it's writing directly into memory, and that's very beneficial for the, for the clusters. So this slide summarizes uh, what I just said. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> a large part of our work is uh, dedicated to uh, open source, and uh, we fully realize the power of the open source community and would like to thank, uh, to take a chance and thank uh, our collaborators and partners. Uh, a lot of things that we do wouldn't be able to happen without you. Uh, within the team, we adopted the rule, uh, the commit rule. So we first commit into trunk, then uh, backport all the branches. Only after that, uh, all the branches, the one, uh, one ahead of our internal branch, and then we commit into our internal branch. So, uh, as I mentioned before, we. <clears throat> uh, uh, there, there is a lot of uh, synergy going on in the open source now. Uh, different companies t uh, <clears throat> uh, team up, uh, working on different uh, projects. And uh, for example, we were involved with implementing Orcus with, with Hortonworks. We work on GPU support and other projects uh, with Microsoft. Uh <clears throat> we are currently working on standby reads with uh, Uber and Pi PayPal. So we know for sure that uh, we'll have uh, another 2x growth in uh, this uh, <clears throat> ongoing uh, year, and preliminary data uh, confirms that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so uh, we divided our next step into sort of three stages. First stage is consistent read from a standby node. Uh, because there is uh, reads are dominant, 95% of, uh, of uh, operations on uh, our clusters are reads. So using that standby node <clears throat> is beneficial. Uh, the second stage is eliminating uh, the lock on the, <clears throat> the global lock, which Eric talked about uh, on the name node uh, by re-implementing the metadata with the key value store. And then the third is like uh, long-term. Uh, once we have re-implemented the key, uh, when, once we have metadata in KV store, it's uh, easier to uh, <clears throat> uh, to partition it into multiple nodes. Uh, so this is the project that's uh, ongoing. The reads from standby. We want uh, our requirement is to make the reads consistent, and consistency means that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so first of all, where, in, where consistency comes from, uh, uh, standby consumes the journal logs from the journal nodes, which uh, uh, the, 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 the journal transactions are published by the active name node and the standby consumes them from the journal. Uh, so, it, uh, so the standby node is always behind, but in most cases, uh, it's up to date, right? Majority of the data is up to date. So uh, it should be beneficial to be able to read from standby. <clears throat> so our consistency requirements include two things. Uh, one is uh, read your own writes, as we call it, uh, which means uh, <clears throat> a client uh, write, writes a file or creates a directory on the active name node, then it tries to read it from the standby. If the standby behind, uh, then uh, he may not see his own rights, right? And the third party communication means that one client uh, <clears throat> uh, creates a directory or writes a file, then informs another cl uh, client which could involve shouting across the room uh, <clears throat> uh, to read it, and that other client, although he received the confirmation that the, uh, the file was created or the directory was created, may not read it. So uh, <clears throat> I will not go into details of this project. Uh, uh, it's all in the JIRA, and, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, and the design document is uh, linked here. So, um, Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to mention that we have an appendix. We'll, we'll have in the slide share, we'll have an appendix with more details about configuration and uh, operational, uh, <clears throat> operational uh, 
issues uh, with the uh, with the satellite cluster. Thank you. Questions? Sure. Yeah, similar to VFS, um, using some of the same components to, uh, kind of similar to Twitter's NFly as well, kind of combining a combined review, yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we did internally. Uh, we didn't bother publishing it. it uh, uh. <clears throat> the, the use case that it supports right now is fairly limited. Um, we'd like to expand it more, but we don't really feel comfortable publishing it in the state that it's in now with a very like specific use case. We'd like to make it more general eventually and then publish it, yeah. You had a question. With the consistent read on secondary name nodes, have you looked at what they're doing with the federated name nodes for the similar function? For federated name nodes. Yeah, uh, name nodes and federations where you just put out name nodes. Right, so here uh, it's a little bit different problem, right? So with federated name nodes, uh, uh, all data is unique on every uh, name node. Here, a standby is a replica of the active name node. So that's where inconsistencies c come from, right? Because it's a replica. So it should be, you know, uh, consistent replica from the client perspective. Yeah. And this allows you to scale while not having to partition your namespace. So that's one of the big drawbacks of federation, right? Is that uh, you have two se or two or more separate partitions, and a rename across them is not. It's no longer an in-memory atomic operation. Um, so that adds a lot of operational overhead. Whereas this is allowing you to scale a little bit while still presenting a single unified namespace. Yeah, so this is, um, that, that's combined. And so, uh, you know, you could argue that because it's 95% reads, are those, are those pulling it down, but the writes are getting hurt. Um, and so we do have some other metrics uh, with sort of latency for read and write broken out separately. And we saw that actually writes became faster, um, even though they were being discriminated a little bit against a little bit, because the name node performance just shot up so much that uh, even if writes are discriminated against, the whole thing is so much faster that it doesn't matter. Uh, no, so this does not present a consistency issue. Um, so for example, you know, if a single, a single client won't submit both a read and a write, uh, if you submit a write, you know, it hasn't actually happened yet if the, the read jumps past it. Uh, yeah, correct, but like I said, since the throughput is so much higher overall, it's actually everybody right. speeds up. So it's kind of a rising tide lifts all boats kind of thing. You, you are right. Uh, it could, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, latency can suffer, or the right latency can suffer. But uh, <clears throat> I mean, we mostly care about throughput, right, uh, with, uh, with our infrastructure. Yeah, so we've considered Hadoop archives. Um, one, so Hadoop archives have a number of issues with their implementation that, that cause some challenges at scale. Um, and we also have um, a problem that most of our data actually needs to be processed fairly frequently. Um, I, don't, I think you did some analysis. No data on our cluster has been cold for more than like a week at a time, something like that. Um, for you know, GDPR, compliance, purging, we're, we're constantly um, mutating almost all of our data. And so putting it into a HAR, you kind of, um, you know, you lose some of that capability. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. This is one of the standard uh, ways to deal with uh, <coughs> small file problems. Uh, I think our small uh, file problem is not as dramatic as uh, we have seen uh, in other organizations. Yeah, sure. So uh, about upgrades, this is last question. I was told time's up. So uh, we, we do test rolling upgrades, and we do, uh, we do use it for smaller clusters. 
but usually for large cluster, because it includes a lot of components that need to be changed, we take an, an hour or two of downtime and uh, uh, <coughs> upgrade with, uh, without rolling. It's just a procedure. All right, thank Thanks you very everyone. much.